Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion in Venture Capital panel. We will begin shortly. Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion in Venture Capital panel. We will begin shortly. We are now ready to kick off the panel discussion, but first, let's meet the host. Andrea Perdomo is the Network Catalyst for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Techstars. Her role is to plan, coordinate, and ignite diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives across the Techstars network and entrepreneurial ecosystem. She believes it is crucial to break down barriers and begin to work together to support communities of innovators and entrepreneurs to help the next generation of tech leaders, entrepreneurs, and investors. Before joining Techstars, she was the co-founder and president at Revelar. Please welcome Andrea Perdomo. Hello, everyone. That was a fun intro. Um, I am at home, but I am excited to be here with you all. Um, so welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion in VC panel. We are going to have an incredible conversation with fantastic panelists um, who I will introduce to you here very shortly. Um, but just to give you a quick, quick introduction on why we're here and why we're having this conversation. We, you know, there's, there's a ton of statistics out there and figures and there's so much data around the gaps that currently exist in VC funding for underrepresented entrepreneurs um, and ultimately right we know that this the ecosystem as it exists today is not equitable. So we're going to have a fantastic conversation around where we are as it relates to equity in VC and entrepreneurship. Um, and we're going to dive into a little bit more of uh, what work is already being done to really change this, as well as you know jumping in to some of the stories of founders who have been able to overcome some of these disparities. So um, welcome everyone. And with that, I'd love to welcome our panelists um, here with us. I love how everybody's rolling in slowly. So hi, everyone. Um, happy, what day is it? Wednesday. <laughs> uh, time is warped these days, but I'm so excited to be able to lead this panel and more importantly, to introduce to you all our incredible uh, guests and panelists and just leaders in this space that I'm excited to be able to uh, to introduce to you all. So, so with that, I know we have a big topic to talk about. Um, before I jump in with introductions for panelists, for anybody who is listening, uh, please let us know if you have any questions. We have some prepared questions, so everybody here is ready to go. Um, but if there's something that you're curious about that you want to learn about, that um, you know maybe you've done your research on some of these panelists and you have a very specific question for them, feel free to, to let us know uh, so that we can make sure to get to those questions that you have as well. Um, so with that, let's let's kick it off. We have four and inc three incredible panelists um and we're going to be talking a lot about again like the ecosystem what changes we can make together uh as it relates to diversity and inclusion um so i will actually lead with Miriam, if you don't mind and unmuting and giving everybody a quick intro on on who you are and, and what you're excited about for this conversation sure thanks so much andrea and uh thanks to the ut dallas team for having me be part of this conversation 
So I'm the executive director of Venture Forward, which is a relatively new initiative launched by the National Venture Capital Association. Uh, NVCA is sort of the industry's trade association that focuses on kind of federal policy and advocacy for the startup and venture capital community. Uh, but Venture Forward actually focuses on the non-policy areas that are really important to the ecosystem. And key amongst those are education, uh, meaning educating the next generation of VC investors, and also around advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive ecosystem. Um, our main kind of uh, focus in this area is diversifying the investor base and making sure you know firms are uh, kind of moving away from what's been the very traditional uh, model uh, of being you know very much a cottage industry and network driven. And so our focus is really around diversifying the investor base, and then also through looking at diversity through an intersectional lens and recognizing that there are um, uh, uh, people of, of you know many different demographics, and, and that can also impact uh, how um, how opportunities or access are available to the industry. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, fantastic. I'm so happy that you are here because that's a very important uh, theme to to this work is actually elevating the representation of funders um, who are making those decisions. So I think that's fantastic. Um, Craig, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, Craig J. Lewis here. I'm the founder and CEO of GigWage. We're a fintech startup. We help businesses and platforms pay people, uh, specifically gig workers, freelancers, independent contractors. And so in its simplest form, we're, we're building a, a modern payroll company. Uh, but at, at scale, our big vision is to drive economic empowerment through building the bank of the gig economy. And we're, we're using payroll as a bridge. Uh, but That's the future of work uh, with the suite of lending products. And so super excited to be here. It's important we're venture backed as well. And I'm happy to be having this conversation today. Amazing. Yeah. And Craig, we're going to jump into some of that success in a second. Um, Benjamin, our final final panelist. Definitely. Uh, hey, Andrea, uh, good to see you again and all the panelists. Glad to be here. And thanks uh, for everyone and partners who put this on. Uh, Benjamin Van, I'm the founder and executive director of Impact Ventures. Uh, we are a startup accelerator and integrated capital fund uh, with a mission to remove the social and economic barriers for women, black and Latinx entrepreneurs uh, building high growth companies. And so we are uh, Dallas based. We've been around since 2016. We've supported about 64 founders that have gone on and raised $1.5 million uh, through our programs. And we're excited to be embarking on a new uh, initial $10 million initiative to fund uh, women and minority owned um, small businesses and startups. So uh, happy to be here and, and discuss this important topic um, and what we can do to work together to change it. Awesome. Fantastic. And Benjamin, I'll get to, to you in a second, but I know you all had just an, an amazing uh, few weeks with, with some wins. So we'll get to those in a, in a minute. Um, so let's, let's kick this off. And again, I have some prepared questions, but we are here to talk to you. We are here to um, really engage with our, the audience on the conversation. So if you have any questions that you are just itching to ask the panelists, please, please let us know. Um, so Craig, I'll start with you. You're um, you know, focal point of, of the work that both Miriam and, and Benjamin are, are doing, which is how do we fund more um, underrepresented entrepreneurs and how do we really do that at scale and how do we really transform the ecosystem? So I'll start with you just from the entrepreneurial perspective. You actually recently raised uh, 13 million for gig wage, which is fantastic. Uh, what, was, what was that experience like? And I think more specifically, right, how would you how would you want to make it different for, for other founders that are following in your path? Yeah, I think um, fundraising is hard, right? Like regardless of gender, race, uh, like it's, it's just hard in general. And then, you know, you can probably 10X or 100X it for um, people that are intentionally ignored. Um, oftentimes we call it underestimated or, you know, all these different terms, but at the end of the day, it's an, it's a very intentional thing that happens. Uh, and whether that's subconsciously or it's intentional. And so I, I call it intentionally ignored groups, uh, which I happen to be one of them. Um, but I think, you know, even though it's hard, you know, one of the things I like to talk about on my journey is really just this kind of commitment to, to excellence. Oftentimes I'll talk about black excellence. And so, you know, everybody likes to tout our $13 million number, which is, 
really just the tip of the iceberg and there's there's much more to come but you know for the first five years of the business um you know we scraped and scrounged together about three and a half million dollars and um that was an all-out fight uh to keep the business alive uh not including the capital that i had to put up out of my own pocket to start the business and then oftentimes just to sustain the business sustain the business in between uh smaller raises and so it's been a grind you know it's like chewing glass and and uh punching bricks and <laughs> and all the fun stuff uh but i think you know the part part of being an entrepreneur is you sign up for that and uh whatever the challenges may be whether it's being black being female being in the wrong geography uh being the b2b and the b2c whatever the challenge is you sign up for that and once you sign up for it you're not only signing up to build something special but um and, and you decide to go down the venture capital path but you've got to figure it out and you've got to sustain and some of the best advice i've ever gotten is just don't run out of oxygen um you've got to keep find a way to keep going and so there's five or six years of trying to figure out how to keep going before you raise that 10 million, then $50 million round. Um, and so it's extremely difficult is the point I want to make, but I do also want to make it is voluntary. Um, no one, no one has uh, put a gun in my head and say, Hey, go be an entrepreneur. You know, the statistics are 0.67 of venture capital goes to black people. I knew that when I signed up. Uh, and so this is a path for the audacious. This is a path for the courageous. And I think a lot of that has powered my ability to raise money. Uh, one, just stepping into the arena, kudos. Uh, but then I think we should keep that courage as we go into the fundraising path. And that was a big part of my journey. In my deal room, I talked about what it's like to be a black entrepreneur and how investors should be thinking about it. Um, and the black brilliance that comes with investing in people like me and what the ROI looks like for that. And so I'm, I, I really just took the approach of facing it head on. Um, but like I said, make no mistake about it. It's difficult and it will always be difficult. Like uh, I, I love the work that they're doing to, to make it easier, but it's a hard, difficult, daunting task. And people should really be cognizant of that when they sign up for it. Yeah, no, I think that that's great, Craig, and pretty spot on, right? Especially for our audience who may, maybe you are an entrepreneur or you're thinking about starting a company. Um, regardless of, of who you are and what your background is, um, it is hard. It is really, really challenging. Um, something that you said really resonated with me is, which is, you know, regardless of which, like you are signing up for this and this journey that does feel like climbing Everest every day. Um, I kind of call it like transparent walls where like you do face them, you can see right through them and it's just trying to figure out how to get over them um, constantly. And so I um, totally, totally feel you on that. And again, thanks for joining the arena and kind of paving the pathway for I think what will be um, hopefully some change that we'll see as it relates to the the, the dollars, the sheer dollars and investment that goes to um, underrepresented, intentionally ignored entrepreneurs. I love of that. Um, Miriam, to you, I think, right, like Craig's the founder, you're trying to impact the, the funding side. Um, can you speak a little bit more to what Venture Forward is doing and what you're actually hoping to accomplish and the impact that, that we're hoping to be able to see through that work in the ecosystem? Yeah, and so I mentioned earlier, you know, our focus is really around the investor base. And we know that if we have a more diverse group of investors uh, with capital to deploy into entrepreneurs, it's going to also lead to a more diverse group of entrepreneurs having access and, and raising capital. And so, um, uh, Andrea, you kind of alluded to this earlier. There's a lot of stats out there. And um, I think we recognize and we understand that the industry has a long way to go. Uh, there has been a historical lack of, of diversity uh, in, in the industry, but I think oftentimes, uh, and at least as we talk about sort of the investor side of things, meaning you know, anyone that's at an established venture firm or even someone who's maybe an emerging manager starting off as a uh, starting off and you know raising their first fund, it's really hard uh, to to raise a, a fund in, in venture capital. And um, the the truth of the matter is, uh, venture the venture industry is small. Firms are small. They tend to be small for the you know the economics of how fun uh, uh, the fun incentives work. Um, you know, there's I mentioned there's not a lot of turnover. You know, there's it's just not, not that big of an industry in terms of the number of people. So your only options really to kind of get into those most senior level decision making positions are you know to start at a, a large firm and make your way up. You know, several after several years because of the long term nature of venture capital, or you you know go out and set off to to raise your own fund. 
And if you do the the second, um, the, the latter option to that, it's you know kind of like starting your own company, right? Like there's a financial risk involved with that. It's very much about um, at least if you're an emerging manager, raising capital from LPs, and you know how do you even find those people who are going to deploy and, and trust you with their wealth for you know ten years, and you're going to return capital. Um, and so it's just I think it's it's sometimes. Um, misunderstood how difficult it can be. And so one of the areas that we are playing a role, an active role in is around um, a, a program that we do called BC University. And this is really to help sort of demystify and dispel the misconceptions about venture capital. And then also just offer more of that like educational aspect to venture, because unless you, you know, take that one class in business school around venture capital, or you happen to live within 50 miles of San Francisco, Boston, or New York, it's probably pretty rare that you will have had much just of an understanding of, of kind of the intricacies and the nuts and bolts of this industry. And so this is a program that we um, do. It's an online course. Uh, we've had um, about a thousand people come through. We offer full scholarships to um, uh, people from historically underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, we actually also do a, a live component to this program and we were in um, Dallas virtually last November. We partnered with SMU to do more of a spotlight on the Dallas ecosystem. But um, our, our goal really here is around democratizing access to education. Uh, and then um, the, the second program that we, we run is called LP Office Hours. And so this kind of uh, feeds into sort of that emerging manager and kind of helping to uh, build relationships with LPs. And so we offer these workshops to essentially connect emerging managers from diverse backgrounds with um, potential sources of, of capital. Um, so, you know, I think those are just some areas where we are focused on. But I also want to um, reiterate that uh, I think oftentimes and as we, we talked to a lot of venture firms and they're all very focused on the D uh, in terms of diversity. But there's also the E and I meaning um, equity and inclusion. And it's one thing to really, you know, get um, one, you know, hire one person from a diverse background onto your team or to, you know, invest in one portfolio company with a, a you know, a black or a female founder and, and just kind of say, okay, you know, I now have a diverse team. I now have a diverse portfolio. And, and that's really, you know, not the spirit of, of, I think, what anyone is looking to do here. And I think it kind of detracts from what is the business case that we all recognize in terms of the future innovation, future of innovation, uh, when we think about uh, making sure that it does, um, uh, bring in the uh, thought and, and diversity of, of people across the country who are um, working on funding, you know, different aspects of of the um, the ecosystem. And so that's something that we also want to make sure that we focus on as we're sort of sharing some of these um, practices with the industry. Yeah, no, Miriam, thank you. And those two programs sound fantastic. So if anybody wants to be uh, learn more about being an investor, they should come talk to you. Um, but I think something that that's really interesting that you that you talked about was access, right? And so, um, you know, something that I've heard that's very common from entrepreneurs and funders is I want to do these things but I need capital to do it. <laughs> so it's like this interesting like chicken and egg scenario. And in your case, right, a lot of it is education. Like I want to um, go be an investor, but I need to have capital and that knowledge in order to do that. And so um, I just think that that's, that's really interesting and like a point that I, that I wanted to highlight there. Um, Benjamin, for you, we have, so uh, one, I just wanted to congratulate you. Uh, I know you got a three-year grant recently. Thank you. For, thank you. Yeah, Ooh. so exciting. I know. I bet you it's been a it's been a roller coaster. Um, so four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which is yes. incredible. And um, counting. And counting. Good. Let's keep it counting. Um, tell us, tell us more about that Impact Ventures, which is what you do. Um, but in particular, I know you're launching the Dallas Inclusive Capital Fund. So tell us more about how that's been going, how that capital that you uh, were able to raise is going to be used. Um, and just, I know you have a massive, um, massive impact that you want to be able to have both for funders and for the entrepreneurs. So yeah, tell us more. The floor is yours. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I really come uh, operate in the intersection between what Craig is saying and, and what Miriam is, is saying as well. And, and I think that the silver lining is that the venture capital industry as a whole is broken. Like the system is broken. Um, and when things are broken, you don't want to use the same tools and same uh, policies to, to recreate them or to fix them. Right. You need new solutions. You need new tools. You need new people, new voices at the table and new strategies 
um, because we know that the system itself was uh, it's rigged in a way where it excluded um, certain groups of people. Right. Um, venture capital in, in itself is a relationship industry. Um, and oftentimes women and people of color don't have uh, proximity uh, to wealth uh, or to those high network um, social uh, relationships to be able to have access to, to venture capital. And so that's kind of where we come in, where being a nonprofit, we're able to operate in spaces where typically for-profit VC funds um, can't. So we see ourselves as a, as a hybrid. Um, and so, you know, at having a platform like Impact Ventures, you know, we have the accelerator where we provide that education and, and the resources and that social capital uh, to the entrepreneurs. You know, we've really taken a step back and saying, you know, not venture capital in itself is the sliver of an industry in terms of the asset class size. Like, you know, not every business is a venture back type business. Um, and when you talk about specific, specific demographics that are buying for venture capital dollars, um, they might not even be set up in a way that venture capital is the best type of capital for them. And so what we often find is there's two ends of the spectrum. There's, there's VC funding that's being pushed right out in the community, whether it be through headlines, uh, newspapers, magazines, and on the other side, you see SBA funding, um, get a small business loan. But we know that um, we're three times more to, likely to be denied for small business loans, right? Um, and so you see both the inequities on both sides, but no one tends to explore all of the capital products and options that are in between. So we see ourselves as an integrated capital where we can provide both flexible debt and patient equity to entrepreneurs to not only grow organically, but retain ownership in their business. Venture capital itself is a polarizing you know, source of capital, meaning that whoever you talk to, they're either going to love it or they're going to hate it. Right. Because it's an extractive um, uh, tool in itself. Um, you know, investors are extracting value um, from entrepreneurs um, in that in the way that they invest. You know, I always say that entrepreneurs create innovation, not investors. Right. Investors pour on gasoline. You know, they empower entrepreneurs. But it is the entrepreneurs that are really creating the, the value. But we often see as they continue to grow, uh, they own less and less and less um, of, of their business. So the way we kind of look at it is, is we're able to touch different um, aspects of similar to what Miriam said. It's not just enough to say we hired, you know, um, a black person to, to run our venture fund, but like really analyzing all the policies like in there in terms of who decides who gets the capital, um, not just shifting capital, but shifting power. Um, how does that power disseminate in terms of the decision making process? Who's in the room when that happens? What are the negative externalities of venture capital that we explore um, in our model? And so um, we're excited to kind of embark on that. It's been a, a process where we tell our entrepreneurs, we know that less than, you know, 0.67 percent of entrepreneurship of venture capital goes to uh, people that look like me. On my end, it's the same thing with, you know, raising philanthropic or um, uh, public dollars where less than 2% of philanthropic dollars go to black um, executive directors in the nonprofit sector. And so I'm kind of tackling two battles where I'm raising philanthropic capital and I'm raising, you know, equity, venture capital, private capital, debt capital, all the sources from all the, all the, the spectrums. And, and I'll say it's been a process, but I know we're going to tap into this. Um, you know, this this whole notion around George Floyd and kind of this awareness around equity has really brought our mission to the forefront. And we haven't changed anything in, in five years of, as an organization. But we think that the heightened and sense of awareness of our external community has really shined a light on our work to say, oh, this is what they're talking about. Oh, this is why this is important. We haven't changed a thing. But now that there's a heightened sense of awareness around how this um, this impacts us all. Right. And I think that's the, the, the greater conversation is that diversity is actually good for all of us. Right. Diversity and inclusion is not just, a, oh, you know, just for the black folks or just for the Latinx folks or Hispanic folks, but it actually benefits us all in the long run. Um, and I think pushing that message and that narrative and changing that narrative is important to diversifying a, a sector that, you know, it's already the system's already broken and, and the players right need to change. And I think we're all kind of doing that work um, in our own way. Yeah, no, that's that's great, Benjamin. There was a lot there. I think great to to start. Um, you know, that was one of the 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 pieces that we just can't ignore, right? I know, like many of you on the call, I was frustrated that it took so long for people to pay attention <laughs> and to open their eyes. It was bizarre to me. Um, but you know, I think the 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 silver lining in it all, as cheesy as that is, is that the public pressure for racial justice has finally reached the entrepreneurial and the venture ecosystem. Um, and, 
you know, I think another something else that you said that's that's really um, really powerful, right? Is that you're playing both fields, <laughs> um, right? So you're kind of in that in that really interesting place of 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 tackling um, to, to areas where traditionally the data and, and for lack of a better word, the numbers are working against you. Um, but something that you brought up that I think is super important for anybody who's who's listening to is this concept of optionality. Um, I think for a very long time, the narrative that has been painted is VC, right? Like the Silicon Valley, like start a company, um, raise money before you even have a product and then also go raise VC and have an exit and that's an IPO. And I think to your point and what all of you are working on is how do we change that narrative of not only what who is represented in that narrative, but the optionality, optionality that exists in actually making your company successful. Um, so I've been talking a lot about you know, why don't we ask founders more about their existence strategy versus their exit strategy? Um, and I, I, I hope that we can start to change that narrative soon. Um, so we do have a, a few audience questions that are starting to roll in, which is great. I'm gonna jump around a little bit and I'll open this up to, to the entire panel. Um, but the first question is actually, um, so what advice would you give for students who want to get into venture capital? And whoever unmutes first gets to go. Craig, I'll uh, I'll jump in. Um, and for perspective, I've talked to thousands of VCs, and I've helped a couple of people raise funds. And currently, a lot of the black emerging funds I deal with, our largest investor is Foundry Group, which is an LP in about thirty different seed funds. And so, I'm um, kind of a, a resource for emerging funds and introductions from an LP perspective. And very very passionate about the venture space. I'm also an angel investor in multiple companies. Um, the thing about investing that I think is so unique, and I think students are perfect for this, especially people that are interested in it, uh, just like with anything, you get to just be it. Uh, there is this kind of misconception that you need capital to do all of this stuff. And to do it at scale, you absolutely do need capital. Uh, but to do it, you do not need capital. The wire that I receive when venture capitalists give me money is only a very short moment of the investment process. It's a very small part of a VC's job is to actually send capital. The due diligence that is required prior to that, the sourcing, the relationship building, the kind of macro research type stuff that needs to happen post the investment, the relationship building, uh, the value add that has to be brought. 99% of being a venture capitalist is not about sending a wire. It's about all of those other things. So as a student, if you're interested in being a venture capitalist, understand what that actual job looks like and start doing those things. No one's going to stop you from diligencing companies, evaluating, building relationships with entrepreneurs. And so I, I don't let capital stop you because again, that's only a sliver of the job. Uh, it's actually really anticlimactic. <laughs> like you get these wires and it's like, oh, that was it. And you kind of like got to go back to all the work and stuff. So like money is only a very, very small part. It's an important part. But as a student, you get to just start doing all of the other stuff. Uh, that would be my idea. Uh, you know, just start meeting entrepreneurs, diligence in companies, offering feedback, learning what good companies look like. Uh, and, and, you know, just decide to, you know, wake up tomorrow and just be a VC. Yeah, no, that's great, Craig. Very Obviously, amazing. that's very, very oversimplified, but <laughs> you get the point. I, I agree with everything Craig said. I would maybe just add a couple of other sort of tactical um, suggestions. Uh, there's some, you know, free, great free resources out there. I think the great thing about what has evolved in venture is what used to be, you know, no information would ever disseminate outside of a couple of miles radius of a couple of geographies, you know, now with the power of, of Twitter and, and medium blogs and just a lot more uh, sharing of information and knowledge, I think out there is uh, a really, um, is a nice, uh, encouraging to see just more of that information being shared out. But um, a couple of resources I would highly recommend if you haven't checked out. Um, there's a book by Brad Feld, who is uh, one at uh, Foundry Group, which Craig mentioned is one of their investors called Venture Deals, which is a great, um, I think, primer to investing. Uh, also a book by Scott Cooper called The Secrets of Sand Hill Road. Um, and then also uh, Venture Deals, there's a, a free online course that you can take. I think they do it a couple of times a year. Um, I mentioned VC University, which is a course that we do, but um, I think there's some some others out there as well. But I think what is important if you are sort of 
thinking about being a venture investor is making sure you understand and take the time to really understand the the mechanics and so you know, just the foundational technical side of the business, but recognize that that is not it. There's so much more in terms of how investors actually navigate things like startup diligence. Like you can learn how it works or you can learn about a term sheet on paper, but then you have to really understand how those things translate to a real world discussion or conversation and how they get uh, implemented. And so what we really focus on in our program is making sure we teach those mechanics, but then also kind of hear from investors on like, okay, but how do you really you know, navigate all of this? Yeah. Yeah. And I would only add just a few cherries on top is, it, it, you know, very, to be very simplistic is um, one to be, to add value, right? So figure out ways to add value to whatever the firm is particularly doing. Try to find the gaps in, in areas where they're not, um, where they're when they're not hitting or where they're not paying attention. Some of the best investors can see forward um, and see ahead, but the the great investors can see around corners. And so the second part is is be a futurist. So if you can see industries that are um, showing trends in the future um, and you can get ahead of certain things, that that's a, a sign of a great investor in adding value. Because venture capital, I mean, like I said, Craig just walked through a snippet of that diligence process. That's very head down research, you know, type of work. If you can look ahead and look forward and look in the vision and add that value to a firm, um, that that will definitely um, bold your case in the industry where, you know, the opportunities don't come very often. You know, it's it's not a revolving door type of industry uh, when you're getting you're in for a while. Um, and so continuing to add value and, and looking forward, I think, will, will help solidify your space in, in that area. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you to all for that. And I, um, you know, I would just echo the knowledge piece, right? Of like, there's so much out there. Um, Venture Deals, I've read that book twice. It doesn't get old. <laughs> um, so I highly, highly recommend reading that. Um, so another question from from the audience, um, and Benjamin, maybe I'll, I'll give this one to you. Um, do you think that Texas is lacking in resources to support investment in startups in the state? So I, I, when you say lacking the resources, I definitely don't think that the state of Texas lacks the resources. I think that we've just historically have a very concentrated set of resources that have been in certain industries um, that n have not yet caught up with uh, the rest of, I would say, the coastal uh, components of, of our just our economy. You know, Dallas has been a very hard asset um, type of uh, economy, you know, oil, land. Um, uh, real estate, et cetera. So I don't, I don't think there's a, a, a lack of access. I think there's just a lack of concentration and expertise, um, particularly in the, in the venture space, because it's just not as often seen, um, especially when you talk about technology and SaaS. I mean, there's, you know, life sciences and health related where we've seen some explosions, uh, even now today more so in the, in the venture world that's coming out of Texas. But I think from, from a technology standpoint, um, you know, we're, we're catching up. Uh, to the rest of the, the major markets. But um, if you're doing anything in the life science, kind of health science, um, uh, you know, anything with a high R&D, um, I think there's a ton of assets. We have a huge medical district. We have a huge medical community uh, that's connecting um, uh, uh, these challenges around resources and wrapping these challenges around resources. Um, and so, yeah, just to be quick, you know, I, I don't think there's a lack of resources. I think just there's, a, there's a concentrated resources that, Folks like us, the more we can see um, success stories, I think we'll start to get the investment community to start to take more risk on things they might not be as familiar with. Yeah, and it's really unlocking those resources, right? It's like they're there. How do you unlock them and how do you make sure that people are aware that they exist? Um, so another question, uh, which I, I will open it up to, to the panel as well. Maybe Craig, I don't know. You all can figure this one out. So what steps should an entrepreneur take before planning on fundraising? What advice do you have? Yeah, so I've raised money pre-product, post-product. I've done kind of everything you could think of. Um, for me, the advice I typically give people now is do as much as you can without other people's capital. Um, and I say that with the caveat of, I'm a big fan of using other people's capital. So if you can get it early, get it. But from a from a discipline perspective of what you're actually able to do with that capital, the further along you are, the better. And it just kind of compounds from there. And so I just, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm an investor in a number of different, you know, early stage companies. 
Um, I advise a bunch of companies. And what I'm always saying is like, how much more can you do? How much more can you push before you really need it? Because all it does, is it, it increases your chance. It limits dilution um, and increases your position. Uh, but it also helps with that use of capital. And so, you know, build that product, uh, launch that MVP, run that survey, you know, hire that person, you know, convince them to work for equity, you know, do as much as you can before you actually go raise capital because again the capital is all sexy and it's attractive and stuff uh but really execution at the end of the day is, is critical and the more you can do without it it becomes super attractive to investors because they can quickly kind of do the math of how much you could do with it and so i'm always encouraging people to do as much as they can without other people's money first unless somebody just really wants to give you a whole lot of it for really good terms take it, take it. <laughs> yeah, take it. Um, yeah, and I think on that, Craig, too, right, is like, um, you know, I always give the advice of look at your business and figure out what your vision is and what you're trying to build. Um, because again, like you might not need that much capital, like you might actually be able to get by with less than you think. Um, and so to Greg's point, you know, on the mentorship and just being able to talk to other um, other people who have been there before, I, I would recommend that 100% is talking to others who maybe are just ahead of you, just enough that you can kind of learn from their mistakes and make, you're going to make new ones, but don't repeat, don't repeat what they, what they've already made. Any other comments on that from Miriam or Benjamin? Build relationships before you need them. So if you're looking, if you know you're going to raise, build a relationship first before you actually make that ask. Uh, the fundraising process is about 80% research and development and relationship building and about 20% of actually like executing uh, the actual, you know, the act of fundraising. So, you know, know how to research, know how to prospect, um, develop a plan. Um, there's, you know, fundraising consultants out there that can help you develop a plan uh, for that. But know what you're raising for. Know how much you're raising. Like you don't want to get caught when you actually do get that meeting. And you can't answer the simple question of what are you raising for? What milestone are you going to is it going to allow you to get to? Because investors want to ingress, invest for outcomes and for growth. Um, they don't want to give capital just for the sake of giving capital because they like you. What are, what are the outcomes that are tied to that 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 ask? And so be able to answer those simple questions when you get in the room. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I you know, echo that on the, the relationships and um you know, connect with us on LinkedIn if you haven't already. Um, so we have time for, for one more question. I saw um, a few comments about internships and our, um, are we hiring? So yes, I think that Miriam and Venture Forward's hiring, Craig is hiring, Techstars is always hiring associates. Um, so definitely look out for some more posts on that. Um, and as a final question, I, you know, I think this is a pretty good one for for the whole the whole crew um but as it relates to um you know venture capital and just the entire you know lots of what we've been talking about like would you say that discrimination is highly prevalent um in the venture capital realm i don't want to put words in your mouth but i'll see what anyone has to say Yes, uh, we live in America. It's uh, woven into the fabric of every single aspect of the great states that exist, all 50 of them, all sectors. Venture capital is not an exception. So whether it's food, uh, you know, bank deserts, education, policy, politics, uh, discrimination, bias and racism, they are kind of different things, actually, interestingly enough, but they're all woven into the fabric of America, so you, you can't escape it. I mean, it is literally the most exhausting thing that is a part of our days as, again, intentionally ignored groups. Uh, there is no denying it, there's no dis escaping it. Church, religion, it doesn't matter where you look, there is definitely discrimination, bias, and uh, flat out racism. And, um, I'm, you know, everyone's doing the work to incrementally improve that and, and, um, extinguish that but we've got hundreds of years of this being ingrained into the fabric of society and so you cannot escape it and venture capital is not exception yeah I, I figured that's what you were going to say craig i just wanted to um open it up i mean right it, it, there's so much systemic racism that just exists across everything and, and in my my own personal opinion i think 
the VC and the, the the ecosystem that we all play in is actually a little late to the to the game and doing something about it. Um, any other last comments, Miriam or Benjamin, on just you know advice for students or or a little bit back to the the question we just asked? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll piggyback on what what Craig is saying is that we know that it exists. I said, but now we're in a day and time where we have to stop putting the onus on. In this case, in the context of entrepreneurship, we have to stop putting the onus on founders to do the self work. Right? It is no longer um, a, uh, a a time where the founder needs to adjust themselves to fit to. The investor, the investor now has to do the self work to understand their own biases, their own prejudices, their own racism, which are all completely different um, social um, constructs that we all have, you know, embedded in us. You know, our, our bias from our experience, our upbringing, our whatever geography we're from, we have these biases. Um, but I think it's from an industry standpoint, it is no longer on the founder to have to um, uh, kind of appropriate to you know this model of what a founder should look like. Investors should be able to do their own self-work to discover what are their own bias, what are their own racial um, uh, 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 shortcomings that they might be walking into a room with um, that they don't even inherently know that they're uh, pushing on founders you know, in a room. And so I think if we can get to a place where investors are willing to do that work, right, versus just, oh, we'll just check the box and hire, you know, a woman or we're higher, you know, African American to, to do the work. So they don't they themselves don't have to interrogate their own biases and in 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 um you know self in inequities. Um I think we have to get to a place where you know it's not on the the founders to have to adjust anymore. It's like accept me as I am and I'm gonna be an awesome founder at the same time. And so uh, I would just say to add on that piece is um, to change the trajectory of who needs to to do the adjustment. Awesome. Miriam, 30 second closing thoughts. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just add, I think, uh, agree with everything Craig and, and Benjamin uh, laid out. I think the um, the additional difficult aspect to kind of breaking out of what the industry has traditionally done is the fact that it has been, you know, investment decisions have typically been made on like gut feel or, you know, if so-and-so is a connection to so-and-so from school or, through another sort of group. And so I think these subjective aspects in the venture capital decision-making process have, I think even more so allowed for bias and discrimination in some cases to, to creep in. And so I'm encouraged to see some firms that I have been speaking to um, who are, I think, wanting to be more intentional about putting in more objective measures and using you know, true performance or levers or metrics that will indicate future performance as, you know, really the measures around why you're going to be making investment decisions and making sure that the people who are making those investment decisions aren't all, you know, of the same fabric or aren't, you know, all didn't go to the same school and have the same group of, you know, 10 friends or whatnot. So um, I, I do think that that has been a, a challenge for the industry. And I, I'm um, some, somewhat encouraged about what I, I am seeing in, in, in terms of some, what some firms are doing. But it, you know, it's not across the board, and I think um, the 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 challenge here will be just uh, you know hopefully this momentum that we're seeing in terms of the sort of national focus on on racial equity and and the focus on innovation and and really trying to you know disrupt and create the next next best thing is I hope that investors will you know continue to prioritize this. Fantastic. No, thank you, Miriam. Um, and I, you're right. Couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, well, that that is time. I hate how quickly that goes by. I feel like we could have this conversation for hours. Um, but I just want to thank you all for for joining this, um, for volunteering your time to come and talk to us. And you know, with that, I know there's an incredible keynote following our conversation. Um, but thank you all again for joining. Thank you for listening. Um, and you know, we're we're making progress. So I think that's the most important takeaway from this call is that there are changes being made. And um, you know, if you want to be a part of it, even better. We we need more. We need more advocates, and we need more people dedicated and passionate about this. Um, but thank you all. Great conversation, and we will see you at the keynote. Bye. Mm -hmm.